In this video, we're going to be talking about breadth-first search, and more specifically, breadth-first search on implicit graphs. So before we get started, let's do a quick recap of what BFS is. And if you don't actually know what BFS is entirely, then please watch our previous video on this. All right, so BFS is basically a graph traversal algorithm that visits nodes depending on the distance from the root. And the root could be any node that you choose. As a consequence of this, we basically get that the closer the node is, the sooner it is going to be processed. Process could mean anything, marking as visited, setting the distance, or doing anything with the data within that node. Now to implement BFS, we're going to typically use a queue to store the nodes to visit. And by using a queue, we can actually get that distance dependent graph traversal, aka a level by level traversal algorithm. And finally, as a result of all of this, we can use BFS to get the distance, which is typically counted with the number of edges, to each node from the starting node. So here right now, I have the BFS pseudocode. And as you can see, we have a pretty clean setup here. So all we need is a few things. We need a queue, a distance array, and a visit array. Now that distance array isn't really necessary, but in other cases, you can just use DFS, which is just easier to code. All right, so what about our queue? So the first thing that we need to do is we need to create a queue with all the possible nodes. We're going to push in our starting node into that queue, mark the distance of the starting node as zero because that's our source node, and we're going to mark that starting node as visited. Then what we're going to say is while the queue is not empty, which is also known as while there are nodes to be processed, Take out the current node, look at all the adjacent nodes n to the current node, and if that node isn't visited, then let's calculate the distance using that formula, and that formula could change, mark it as visited, and then just push it into our queue because it needs to be visited now. Alright, so that's pretty much the pseudocode, and if you're unfamiliar with this, please watch our previous video on BFS. Okay, so what about BFS on not-so-obvious graphs? Well, Basically, some problems require BFS or DFS, even though there is not an obvious graph. And sometimes BFS can be done on grids. Other times it could be done on states as well. But in this video, we're going to be talking about specifically BFS on grids. All right. So with graph search on grids, there's actually four main things that we need to keep in mind. Number one is that each cell is a node. So you can see on the left here, I have a grid. And on the right here, I have a graph with nodes on it. None of the edges are connected, but that doesn't matter for now. So you can see that each cell is a node. The next thing that we want to keep in mind is that the movement to adjacent cells are edges. So let's say we had this node X here, and I want to go up, down, left, and right. Well, that's going to look something like this, right? Well, what does that look like on my graph? Well, it looks the exact same. With that X, I have up, down, left, and right to the exact nodes that I'm pointing in the grid. Pretty self-explanatory. The third thing that we want to keep in mind is that we can keep an array of possible moves. Now, this isn't actually necessary for BFS, but it is easier to keep track of your code and make the writing process a little easier. So, for example, let's say we wanted to go up. Well, in the grid, what does that mean? Well, in the grid, that means I want to go one up in the rows and keep the column the same. So what does that look like? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to subtract one to the row and keep the column the same. So we can represent that as a pair of negative one and zero. Let's say we wanted to go down. Well, that means adding one to the row and keeping the column the same. So that's a pair of 1 and 0. What if I wanted to go to the left? Well, the left means keep the row the same, but minus 1 to the column. So that's the pair 0, negative 1. And let's say we wanted to go to the right. That's basically 0 and 1. All right, so this is just a little thing that you can do to speed up the typing process of your code but this doesn't change the complexity of it. All right, 
So the final thing that we need to do is we need to check if the cell is within the current range of the entire grid. So for example, for zero index grids, we want to check if the row that we're going to is within zero and R, and the column that we're going to is between zero and C, where R and C are the bounds of my grid. All right, let's look at a practice example of grid BFS. So given a 2D array of ones and zeros with zero representing a floor and one representing a wall, print the shortest distance from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. If it's impossible, print negative one. So in terms of samples, here's a quick sample for you. On the bottom left, we have the answer as 16. In the middle, we have the answer as eight. And on the right, it's negative one since it's impossible. The only possible moves that we have are to go up, down, left, and right. All right, so give it a try. All right, so now that you've probably tried it yourself, let's take it up together. So for here, I have sample input one, sample input two, and sample input three. And we're already given the answer for all of these, so make sure that you have them correctly inputted. All right. The first thing that we want to do is we actually want to say from collections, import a D key or a deck. It doesn't really matter how you say it. I'm going to say deck. All right. The next thing that we might want to do is we might want to say, okay, moves is equal to this array here. And it's an array of arrays, but it's all the possible moves that we can make. So we have negative one, zero, one, zero, zero, negative one, and of course, zero, one. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a function called shortest distance. And it's going to take in one of these grids. The first thing that I want to do is I want to measure what exactly is the dimension of this grid, because I actually don't know. So I'm going to say it's the length of the grid, and this will give me the number of rows. And let's say it's a rectangular grid. It's not some kind of weird shaped grid. Then we're going to say C is equal to length of grid zero. And this will give me the number of columns. Okay. The next thing I want to do is I want to create that visited and distance array. In this case, it's going to be a 2D array that's going to say, okay, well, is this current x, y coordinate visited or has the distance already been calculated? But let's create those 2D arrays now. So we're going to say vis is equal to false times r for i in range of c. So what does this do? This basically creates a 2D array of a bunch of falses r by c in dimension. The same thing can be done with the distance array. So we can say it's 0 times r for i in range of c. And that'll create a 2D distance array filled with a bunch of zeros. So now let's create our DQ or our deck. And we're going to say q.append. What's our starting position? Our starting position is the top left, which in terms of a grid is 0, 0. All right. So what's the next thing we need to do? The next thing we need to say is visited 0, 0 is equal to true. Because essentially what we're saying is that the starting node has already been visited. And well, yeah, it has already been visited. Same thing with the distance. And we can mark it as zero, but this is a bit redundant. All right. So while the length of the queue, which basically means that while there's stuff in the queue, we're going to take out the top thing. So queue.pop left. And you can kind of think of a queue as like an array where the left is the front and then the right side is the back. So here what we're doing is we're just taking the pop left or the left thing in the queue. Okay. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say for dx, dy in moves, which what does that mean? It says for each of these moves, extract the x and y directions that I'm going to go in. So that's direction x and direction y. All right. 
So what am I gonna do with dx and dy? Well, I'm basically going to calculate the new direction or the new cell that I'm going to go into. So that's just gonna say nx or new x, just to be more clear, is x plus dx, right? So this is my current position. This is the new position I want to go to. And sorry for the semicolon. And we can do the same thing for the new y position. Oops, there we go. Now, now that I have the new x and new y position, what do I wanna do? Well, I just wanna say whether or not, first thing I wanna do is I wanna check whether or not it's within the bounds. So if new x is greater than or equal to zero, and new x is less than r, and new y is greater than or equal to zero, and new y is less than c, and there's a few more things that we need to check, and we haven't visited this new position, and one last thing, and the thing I'm going to, so new x, new y, is equal to a zero, then I can finally say, well, q.append, new x, and new y. Same thing for the visit array. We're gonna say new x, new y, is equal to true, because we're gonna visit it, and we're gonna say that the distance to that new position is the distance of the old position plus one, because it just takes one step to get there. All right, so that's pretty much the BFS finished. And what do we do at the end? Well, we're just gonna say, well, if we haven't visited the bottom right, which can be calculated saying R minus one, C minus one. Oops. If we haven't visited, print negative one, and then otherwise, we can just print the distance to that location. All right. So let's call these sample inputs. So we're going to say sample input one. And let's do the same thing for sample input two and three. So let's run it. 16, 8, and negative one, which is exactly what I had shown you guys earlier. So that's pretty much it for BFS on a grid or implicit graphs.